Um, okay, so uh, back on the this topic, I guess, of um, crypto Jewish rituals, you mentioned also cooking with your grandmothers and learning to check for blood, right, in the egg. Correct. Or throwing the piece of dough in the back of the oven if it's more than five pounds. And checking the vegetables for insects. Okay. Religiously, Swiss chard mm -hmm. and other vegetables, checking them outside in the light. Mm -hmm. uh, she would meticulously check the uh, insects. Mm -hmm. And since Jews that became crypto Jews could only keep it in the home, it really became a identity of the home, correct? Correct. And so I'm curious, as you've clearly dedicated your life to this, and I imagine you have people that you meet that share their own stories, right? Correct. Um, could you share some of, um, I know there's always people that are interested in, what are other kind of clues that people had of traditions that were kept from generation to generation? So there's a really huge one mm -hmm. <clears throat> that when I first told Michael, and Michael, thank you, you know, you've been right next to me with this, and <clears throat> Michael's an Ashkenaz Jew from Romania, and, you know, none of this could have been easy. I recognize that, you know, me having dreams and seeing balls flying around in the air and <laughs> rabbis appearing to me in the middle of the night, you know, none of that could have been easy for you. And I do want to acknowledge that publicly because he doesn't move from my side in supporting this. Uh, like my son calls this my project. Mm -hmm. So, um, but other, so there was a big, big thing which was sweeping to the center of the room. So <clears throat> this was done during the Inquisition so that you wouldn't sweep dirt where the mezuzah used to be because we couldn't have mezuzahs in the 1400s. So, uh, Michael, I went to my first crypto-Jewish convention in Colorado. Later, I became president of the society, and Michael says, maybe you don't mention that. <laughs> I said, really? Why? He said, it sounds a little weird, you know, the trash outside the door 500 years ago. Maybe you don't mention that. And I said, well, if you really think it's that weird, I, you know, okay, fine. So we get to the first night and we have a troop of crypto Jewish players from Mexico. And the uh, musician gets up and says, how many of you sweep to the center of the room? <laughs> and that was like my best I told you so moment. <laughs> So that's an unusual one as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and you mentioned that your grandmother had kept this in incredible jewelry, right? And that it was to be given to you Correct. on the day of her death, which I thought was interesting, not just upon her death, but the day of her death. The day of her death, yes. Um, and I remember when you were kind of going through your different family members' reactions to your uh, project, <laughs> um, you know, and the people were very unhappy, though it was not a tragedy, right. um, that um, that your maternal grandmother said that what you're doing is very dangerous. I think she meant for me to be a Jew. Mm -hmm. I am certain that my maternal grandmother knew my, uh, she had five grandchildren. Um, the absence of my sister speaking in the film. Uh, it speaks volumes. And I told her when she didn't want to be interviewed, I said to her, your not speaking will speak louder than your speaking. And I said, and I will mention it at every audience. <laughs> so <laughs> um, she's four years older than me and um, she didn't want to be, she's not, uh, she's, she's not a religious woman. So she didn't think that she was relevant to this and really didn't want to be a part of it, and, and that's fine. Um, my children, on the other hand, I thought they wouldn't want to be a part of it, and they like, you couldn't stop them from talking. <laughs> and I did not, uh, they, they spoke alone to the director when they were interviewed. I still don't understand why my son was speaking Spanish, but that's okay. Uh, you know, we've been, we teased a lot about it, you know, and, and we had to cut it down. It was half an hour each, it's only an hour movie, so. I didn't censor anything, even when he said, I wasn't censored, it was just no, not enough time, you know? The, there went the pork chops, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it was a big change for the family, and like my first cousin, she was also a granddaughter of my grandmother, um, you know, 
she was like, she's, she's agnostic. So if I had to choose a religion, it would be Judaism, but she's agnostic. Everyone else in the family is very Catholic. Um, something that I didn't put in the movie because I prefer to talk about it personally is that in 2014, my mother says to me that she wants to meet with my rabbi. And I'm like, oi. <laughs> yeah, like, oi. It was such a difficult time with my mom. And uh, Michael said, I'll take her. Thank you. <laughs> Please spare me. And she told the rabbi she did not want to die Catholic. And because of the return that I had gotten um, from the Beit Din in Israel, finally when I showed up with all my burned relatives and all of this, um, she only had to do one mitzvah, take it on, and that was it because she was a Jew but she had to take it on. So the rabbi told her to light candles, and that Friday I went to her house, she lit candles, I went home, I lit candles, and that Sunday my dad says, listen, we have got a problem, I'm taking your mom to the hospital. She's gone into this deep abyss of an Alzheimer. Bottom line, she was in Alzheimer's seven years, never came back, that was her last conscious act, and she died two years ago so that my mom returned. Wow. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that answer. <laughs> I, I usually, I, I didn't want to put it in the film, yeah. but I did want to talk about that. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Okay, so um, I was really struck by how you portray Freda Mosey, right? The, 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 right, the, the town, village. The, the village right. that your family came from. And you mentioned that it seemed always to you that it was a, a town that stood still in time, right. and I think that your kind of cinematographic choices reflect that, right? This um, very permeable um, boundary between the present and the past. No, that's what it really looks like. Yes, but I'll, yeah, I'm saying no, there's no, no but, modern art. <laughs> yes, yes, but I'll say like, like the choices that you made to have like the, the women dressed in maybe the you oh know, the grandmothers. Yes, exactly, yeah. and the, and like you're walking down the street and then you know you have right, a flash right. to somebody presumably 500 years before. Right. Um. So I don't. I think that this notion of towns that um that have stood still in time that, that that have not evolved and that are full of ghosts and histories untold is a theme in crypto Jewish literature. I wonder if you've ever um, read the book. Um, the Ghost of Hannah Mendes? I was going to say uh, Doreen uh, Carvajal's The Forgotten sure. River. Sure. So I feel like that's really present in her book. So Doreen and I are actually very good friends. Okay. Yeah. So suggested reading if you're interested. Um, um, but it's this idea that um, it's not empty and the silence is covering up a willful forgetting. Um, and that interestingly, it's this towns, historians who kind of guard these secrets. And so I wanted to ask you about the mikvah, the synagogue in the town, that when you come in and it's guarded through the garage, what was, I'm curious about you circling back with the homeowner who had been there for 60 years. Oh my gosh, I felt so bad, but I did it anyway. Yeah, but I what mean, was, I mean, what was her <laughs> understanding of what the mikvah was and that it was there and trying She to never understood like, what that was, no. Um, it was almost not important. Uh, when I found all these things, it took me five and a half years to convert. You, you understand that an Orthodox baked in in Miami is not gonna easily convert somebody who's not converting her kids. I mean, how do you live in the house alone? There's a gazillion laws, I, I'm sure you can imagine. So um, it took me a very long time. Now, I was the very first person that ever did this. Uh, let's say go back, find, and uh, go to a big din in Israel. And, and people say, well, how did you know what to give them? How did you know what to, what documents, what this? And I said, I didn't know, but I knew what a big din was like. You know, an Orthodox they did in Miami was probably times 50 in Israel. Mm -hmm. And so I just figured I got to, you know, do it like this. And I just documented every grandmother mm -hmm. uh, going back. But when they gave me all of this, find this and find that, I, I there was no choice. I, I had no choice but to, to find something. But because I have always been in pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. 
and I was never a historian until this happened. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Madrid and I found two historians that came with me and verified everything. Fascinating. Um, wanted to ask you about your experience. Oh, and we'll open up to the questions in just a minute. Um, your experience of seeing the Inquisition documents, I mean, only in Portugal, I did the math, I'm not a mathematician, but there were about 43,000 in just the three cities that you noted. Right. What was that like for you when you know that your own family suffered? I have to tell you, um, so in the middle of that scene, um, the head of the Inquisition department, the lady that was next to me, as well as I, was so shocked that they didn't wear gloves and were looking at these documents from 14. And so I don't know what, uh, you know, I don't know why, but I had turned it. This was all my whole family, all 45 of them. She had the ones that I've been able to identify from 12 year olds to 87 year olds that were burned at the stake. So I turned to the last page and with my bare hand, I touched or rubbed the signature of the Inquisitor. And I had to stop the filming. I was such nausea without, it wasn't something I called, it wasn't something I was thinking about, because sometimes we call things the nausea that I had to run to the bathroom, and I was there for about half an hour with the nausea, and then when we came back to film, I asked her for gloves mm -hmm. if I was going to be touching them. So uh, this is the second time that they pull out my family. Um, it's very hard. It's very hard to be in the cells. I was showing the film last week in Mexico City and I wanted, as I made a point, to stand inside the cell where Luis de Carvajal, who was also a relative that um, he was burned in 1596 in Mexico City, and I made a point to be inside the cell. And like uh, the head of the Jewish Foundation in Madrid said, uh, or somebody said that I know the pain and the pain is real. This is genetic, whatever you want to call it. It's in the soul, it's in the blood, it's in, the pain is very real. Um, I'll ask one last, um, I'll ask one last question and then we can open it up. Um, I noticed that the sea was a really important image in your film and um, the sea was the avenue, right, to the Sephardic diaspora and to the crypto Jews. From Lisbon in particular, you have one of a ship looking out to the Atlantic. Um, that was how these Jews and crypto Jews um, maintained their lives in a diff or recreated their lives anew. And so I'm just curious about a reflection on your part of the place it has in your film. Uh it was used as a separation between film, uh, but to me that entrance into Lisbon, I, the drone did an entrance into Lisbon and I had asked the director if the drone could have the exit over the sea, but he was just trying to make a point. But yes, it seems that my family has gone over the sea when they went from they were in Spain, then they went to Portugal, then they were caught in the Inquisition of Canary Islands, and then they went to Cartagena, Colombia. They were sentenced in Cartagena, Colombia before they moved to Cuba and Costa Rica and the madness stopped. So um, always over the sea. But I wanna point out something that I also don't talk about. I mean, we have 658 hours left of footage. This film is an hour, so. Um, the gentleman that spoke last from Barra Salada in East by the Sea, and here was a group of people who were in the city of San Salvador, and they were commercial dealing people. You know, they were bank workers, this and that and the other, and it's uh, very difficult to get kosher meat. And when they converted, they would only eat fish. And it was very difficult to get. So they made a community by the sea so that they could eat kosher fish. They moved and picked up all their families. Their fervor is palpable. Amazing. Okay, so we might have time for a few questions. 
um, Susan, do you want to mediate that? Like you, you can just just call on people. Oh, yeah. Oh, just stand up and speak loudly. Hi, I'm Margarita Persico. Oh, um, no, are you? Came She's with a Facebook Facebook friend, friend, which is great. It's <laughs> nice to meet you. And a student during the pandemic who embraced us. Right. I just wanted to share, you said that Michael thought I was it, that it was very strange. No. And sweeping towards the center. In my family, at home, my mom always, if she saw me that I would sweep outside a door, she would scream at me. <laughs> so you swept always to the center of always, the room. She yeah. always taught us. And the, uh, the egg checking. So it's very common in my family is from Puerto Rico. Thanks, thanks, yeah. Right behind? Yes, yeah. the lady. Yes. Repeat the question. First of all, thank you. It's wonderful. But I wonder if other people have this question. Did you ever do your DNA? Okay, so I'm just going to repeat the question. Um, first, a comment that it was wonderful, then thank you. And um, did you ever do your DNA? Yes, I've done it with five different companies, just in case. <laughs> And um, my DNA shows uh, about a quarter uh, Sephardic, and then it showed a quarter Ashkenaz, which is when I, when I saw the quarter Ashkenaz, and I don't have one Ashkenaz paper, um, is when I started investigating dad. And then dad has about 45% Ashkenaz, and um, mom is at 52% Ashkenaz, I'm sorry, Sephardic. So the reality, then I ran back all 28 lines going back from my great grandparents and all of them go back to crypto Jews. Uh, Ken Shulman. Um, early on in the film, you talked about this large proportion of crypto Jews who composed the first wave of immigrants coming into Cuba. Was there a similar phenomenon with other waves of uh, Spanish migrants in the 16th century? So I have been digitizing records for over 12, 13 years because my digitization projects around the world uh, were taking too long. There's a lot of red tape. We just finished digitizing all of Portugal. It will be up online very soon. And as you can see, I'm going back to the Pope and the Vatican wanting the secret archives, which he promised me I could have it, but I've run into red tape. I'm going back in May. So to um, what you're saying, there is a, uh, a rec there are some records that I'm digitizing called Viaje a Indias, which show every single person that came from Spain, from a Spanish port to a Spanish port, meaning like Spain to Mexico, Peru, Uruguay, etc., and Every single it's a ship manifest from 1536 to 1834, and I'm holding by like 1690, and that is jam packed, going to every single island from Hispaniola to Cuba to this and that, with the names that are recognized as Sephardic names. But I'm not done digitizing because no one ever wants to help. Everyone wants to help, and then they last like three days. And then it's like, you can't possibly be doing this yourself. And so it'll be finished soon. <laughs> and if I can just add to that answer, there is a high percentage, and it's known, of crypto Jews that came over sure. with those first expeditions. And there's such an interest actually now that there was an article in The Atlantic just a few years ago um, that I like to share, and it documents that about a quarter of Latin Americans have uh, these roots, of uh, crypto-Jewish roots, um, and this is not included in what we could think about when we think about modern Latin American Jewish communities. Those are later diaspora migrations. Okay, great. Now you answered part of my question um, about the 15 grandmothers, but what about the grandfathers? I have no idea. I'm no. Um, <laughs> to, to be able to go back in a traditional sense in a Beit Din in Israel, I had to focus on the women uh, because those are traditional Jewish lineages. So obviously just with thousands and thousands of documents that I had to locate. So from my maternal side, I didn't uh, bother too much with the men because I was focusing on that. On my dad's side, once I realized, um, 
I was lucky enough when they were both at the memory care center, um, I didn't find, like, I, I, I couldn't find the right moment to swap their cheeks and do their DNA. And I managed to do it while everyone gave me dirty looks and that's, you know, fine. But I was able to find my parents' DNA because of that. And so I searched the grandfathers from my dad's side and that's how I found the castle that you saw with Sigler de Pinoza, but I didn't search the men from my mom's side. Everyone married each other, meaning everyone was a first or second cousin, even my grandparents. So there was almost no need because the intermarriage was rampant down to my um, grandparents, first cousins. Um. My daughter hates that I say that in public. Okay, I'm going to go all the way to the back row. The lady, you, you raising your hand. Yes. Yes, you. Uh, did your mother, did your mother have any sense of her, uh, the, uh, the, the Judaism? Uh, did she ever mention it? Was it a feeling within her, or was she just totally ignorant about it? Just hadn't happened in her mother? I really don't know. Mom was a socialite. And I think that if she knew, she didn't want to talk about it. Uh, she was not anti-Semitic, but if she knew, she did not want to talk about it. And then when she returned with the rabbi and Michael, um, I was shocked. So she must have kept it very well hidden, but I will tell you that when I found the recipes of the Inquisition, um, going back hundreds of years, in her bottom kitchen drawer, right along with it, I found almost every single marriage, death, and birth certificate that had taken me almost a decade to locate. Mom had all the, mom had all the originals. Wow. And so that's all I can tell you. That's all I can tell you. And people ask me a lot, nobody's asked, but I'll offer it. What about my children today? Mm -hmm. So my son um, lives in Maryland. He's got the little girl that was in the picture, long brown hair, and she's adopted. So this lineage does not sit with my son's daughter. And the little girl in three years old that's in my daughter's video, um, this whole legacy, her name is Lola, and this whole legacy sits on her head, wow. period. Neither are gonna have more children. Lola doesn't know it yet. You know, she's still on the merry-go-round, but Lola will have a merry-go-round because this is Lola's legacy. Um, my children are not religious. My daughter is a lot of Catholic, and I was Catholic and Catholic. She has never baptized Lola. She did not get married in the Catholic Church. So, you know, you wonder. And I don't talk religion to my children. They're respectful. I have pots and pans at their houses. We do Shabbat. I cook my food, etc. But my son also is not religious. Okay, on the corner in the back there. Yes. Hi, Bobby. Hi. Um, I'm a Cuban Jew. Oh, hi, really proud. So one of the most important goals that I find is to share the digitization that I have done. This isn't just names and dates. These are genealogical trees. I have uh, used about 180 or 200 uh, different uh, bibliographies so far. Everything is pretty much um, following the diaspora of crypto-Jewish families. So it's not like a usual digitization via what I have uploaded myself, what I personally have done on Excel sheets, and it's up on my website. You can look at it, it's called Ancestor Search, and people can follow the diaspora of a family, and uh, I discovered mostly that it's going west. So the algorithm in my databases is going west, and those databases right now, and that's where I'm going with a shorter version of the film and the databases, 
I, I want this available in museums and Jewish institutions around the world um, so that people can just go in and find their lineages in this way. That's where I'm going with this now. Some years ago, it was maybe 15 or, or so years ago, Spain announced a program to enable descendants of the Inquisition to return. So can you tell us how successful that was? So they um, started limiting a lot of that. They expected throngs of people to return. At the end, the program, I believe, only took 20,000 people and they expected people to return. That program was never for people like me. That program, you had to prove that you were part of a Sephardic community. Um, a lot of people benefited from it in Morocco and in the diaspora, the Sephardic diaspora, a lot of people benefited from it in Venezuela and uh, countries that were having uh, political issues. But for people like me, the whole going through a Catholic church thing was not the genealogy that they were looking for. So they were marginally successful and they have been marginally successful in Portugal. Okay, I think we have time for one more question in the blue sweater. I'm going to give you the unpopular answer, but the one that I feel at this juncture, I, I field about four to 600 emails a month that ask me the same question. And the answer is, join the Jewish people, affiliate yourself with the Jewish people, a lot more interest and resources will be available to you um, if not physically, then at least emotionally, if, uh, and again, an unpopular answer, if you're on the inside. If you're on the outside trying to prove that you're a Jew, it will be incredibly difficult for you to access certain locations, certain archives, certain things. If you feel so strongly, but for me it happened accidentally, but convert and prove you're a Jew later. Okay. That's the unpopular answer. Thank you, Jeannie, so much.